My name is Stephanie Hoffman. We're here with Laurent Montiou at Northwest Wine Company. It is September 5th, 2017. And we'll start off with an easy question, which is why wine? Why wine? Oh, easy question, pretty long answer actually. Um, I started studying engineering and agricultural technique. Uh, the school was actually right next to the wine school. And so I realized that they were seemingly were having a lot more fun than we were in our department. So uh, pretty much I switched school the year after and started really enjoying uh, winemaking. Uh, and that was combined also with skiing activities. A lot of the people that were in that school were good skiers, but also were owners of properties, of vineyards. And their parents would only let them ski if they would have done their chores, their task in the vineyard. So I ended up helping them you know, achieve those tasks and so we could go skiing faster. So the combination of, you know, fun, fun and fun made it go to the wine side. So when did you decide to start actually focusing on wine yourself? So that was about, you know, 22 years old when I was, you know, switching from one specialty of engineering to focusing strictly on winemaking. Mm -hmm. So when and why did you decide to come to America? So as I was studying enology in Bordeaux, uh, I also wanted to make sure that I had a good command of the English language. And so I had two internships kind of lined up or in search of, I should say. One was in South Africa and the other one was in Napa. And quite frankly, by luck, I ended up in Napa. And after that, I uh, ended up working in Napa for two vintages. And after the last vintage, I was offered a position, a full winemaker in the southern part of the state of Oregon. And that's when I first arrived here in Oregon back in 1988. Uh, did you um, know about Oregon wine before you came here? No, all I know about Oregon was the fur. <laughs> Douglas fir. I, my grandpa was somebody that worked wood and so he knew about the Oregon pine and that's about it. So I did not know anything about Oregon until uh, I started looking at uh, the map and realizing that I was not too far from California and Napa and uh, so took a stroll with my motorcycle and came up to Oregon. What was your first impression of the Oregon wine industry? Well at the time, as you can imagine, 1988 uh, it was not quite as developed as what we are now. There was some fantastic wine that had been made of the vintage 1985 and 1983. So I realized very quickly that the quality of wine potentially made here in Oregon could be very, very high. So uh, that was exciting. As far as the, the size of the industry was also definitely an area that uh, was going to be improved upon because it was small. And so I thought that for a person 24 years old, that was a great opportunity and a great great place to be. Um, can you tell us about your time at Bridgeview Vineyard and at Willa Kinsey? Yes. So Bridgeview Vineyard was eight years and Willa Kinsey about eight years as well. Uh, so I first started at Bridgeview, as I said, uh, coming up on a motorcycle to Cave Junction, Oregon, and uh, ended up really enjoying the surrounding and uh, working for Bob and Lilo Caravan. Uh, that gave me a great opportunity. You know, essentially, they said, hey, you out of school, can, can you run a winery? And I'm like, sure, of course I can run a winery. And obviously had no idea how to, but um, they gave me a great opportunity. So that was my first kind of, you know, opportunity to be in charge of every aspect of the winemaking. And uh, it was very, very nice. They had a fantastic vineyard in the Illinois Valley. And eight years into this venture, I met uh, my future partner, uh, Bernie Lacroot, and his wife, Ronnie. And so we were able to uh, connect and start Willa Kenzie. So it was an intricate part of the, the origin of the Willa Kenzie brand label and, and um, you know, everything that was created around the, the winery. Uh, and that was a great opportunity. Somebody, uh, you know, I came from a Crescent Ranch winery uh, and I had the opportunity to have everything the best way possible. Bernie and Ronnie said, hey, let's design a winery and let's design it the best way we know how to. So that was a pretty incredible opportunity. Yeah. Um, how did this time influence you for the future in the industry? Hmm. It's an interesting question. I'm not sure how to answer it. Uh, I'll think about it for a second. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, it's, it's all part of the, the journey. So obviously what I experienced at Bridgeview was very different than what I experienced at Willa Kenzie, but the whole package obviously gave me 
a much better comprehension of what the industry is about and what winemaking in Oregon is about. That's my best shot at it. I didn't like the question. <laughs> um, so how did you pick the site for the Domaine Danielle Durant um, vineyard? So that's an interesting story. That was actually a property that uh, was purchased uh, in 1999 as a home site first. And then uh, we created um, Solena the daughter and then the uh, brand and winery came after, name after the daughter obviously, and then we decided it was time to put some of our name on the bottle, Danielle and myself, and so we created Domaine Daniel Laurent, which is the original vineyard property that was planted on that site, and that was actually from gifted vines from people that um, wanted to uh, gift us uh, a wedding present, uh, they gifted us vines, so we planted the first acres on that property. So essentially, the Domaine Daniel Laurent is also known as the wedding vineyard. Mm -hmm. And um, what makes the vineyard special? Well, many things. I mean, on top of that story that I just told you makes it pretty romantic and emotional, of course. Uh, but certainly, uh, it's on Willakenzie terroir, so it's a sedimentary soil. It's very densely planted, uh, and it's on a diversity of clones and of different expression of Pinot Noir. So just on five acres, we have six different clones, so that expresses the uniqueness of Pinot Noir here in Oregon. So I think that's a big attribute of this particular site. And then what did you hope that Salina Estate would be whenever you created the label? I'm sorry? Um, what, like, what were your hopes for that brand or that label? Um, so, you know, Solena Estate is really a property that is focused on doing the very best job at expressing that property, the quality that are so unique to that property. Uh, and so I think we do a really good job at making a wine that is distinct and really has a sense of place. So to that purpose, we've been entirely organic and we've also followed some biodynamic uh, convictions. And so it's been uh, fascinating to do so. Uh, so yeah, we, uh, we, um, we feel that what's been accomplished is pretty much on target with what potentially our goal would have been back 15 years ago. Uh, did you always have a focus or an interest on um, farming biodynamically? No, actually that's, um, that's something that was uh, kind of uh, important, uh, that was actually uh, discovered uh, by Jimmy and you know we talked about it quite a bit. I remember some of the last trip that we took up to Seattle together uh, in a car and uh, we actually ended up staying in the same room up there in Seattle. It was you know a lot cheaper for us and uh, talking a lot about biodynamism and how uh, Jimmy had kind of led the way a little bit in some things that uh, I didn't quite comprehend at the time and uh, was fascinated by. So um, yeah I have to say that all my convictions about biodynamism have been uh, because of uh, Jimmy kind of uh, opening the door for me. And then what were some of the challenges of um, starting the label from scratch? Mm, I don't know if I would call them challenges, uh, but certainly uh, when you start a label from, uh, from the ground up, uh, you know, making wine is very easy. Um, designing a label is challenging. All those things that you think about the creativity uh, are presumably hard, but nothing is as hard as selling the wine. So uh, creating all that actually when you look at it in comparison to, you know, making sure that all the customers that you had in diverse places, Danielle was at Archery Summit, I was at Willa Kenzie, making sure that some of those people that knew us followed us is a, is a critical aspect. So. Uh, yeah, sales of wine is the most challenging aspect, like anything else. Mm -hmm. And then, why did you decide to start Northwest Wine Company? So, Northwest Wine Company is actually a little bit of a byproduct of Solena. Um, we had great success with starting a little Solena brand, and we wanted actually uh, to be a garage yeast winemaker. In other words, we're going to make wine in a little garage, and that's it, a thousand cases, no more. Uh, but we had a lot of requests for Pinot Gris. Uh, you know, at Wallachensee I made a lot of uh, Pinot Gris and people enjoyed it. And so a lot of restaurateurs, wholesalers, retailers came to me and said, oh, you should really make Pinot Gris, you know. 
think about your family, cash flow, those kind of things. And so uh, I looked for a spot on where to make Pinot Gris, and I actually had like a tank rented out, rented out at Chateau Benoit, now NME, and uh, was going to be just fine making my little tank there and somebody said hey you should check out this place in McMinnville uh, there's a huge facility they have refrigeration maybe you could put a few tanks there and and make wine so I ended up going there visiting with my current partner John Niemeyer and uh, he had bought this place from the old Mrs. Smith's Bay factory in McMinnville uh, the beauty of that place is that not only did they bake cookies they also froze them uh, or pies I should say and so they had a lot of refrigeration. So uh, he said, well, that sounds cool. You could make a little bit of your wine here, no problem. But why don't we actually create a little bit of a bigger winery and let's make wine for other people. And that's how Northwest Wine Company got created because one of our biggest concept is making wine for people that have no winery, no knowledge on, to make, on how to make wine. Essentially, we're able to assist them from grape to bottle. And then how, since you do have so many labels here that you make um, in Northwest Wine Company, how do you ensure that each wine is unique? So we, again, it's a sense of place and it's blending wines in different artful manners. Uh, so we really pride ourselves in the fact that we, we try to uh, you know, make a wine that has not only a sense of place, but a sense of story or a sense of uh, varietal and so on, attached with the particular brand that it will be, you know, labeled and bottled under. Uh, so we, you know, life would be way too boring if we just had this one big blended tank and just open the spigot and bottle it as, you know, 80 different labels. So we try to really commit ourselves to making, again, that, that wine that has a, a soul behind it. Mm -hmm. And then, um, what are some of the things you have to consider or challenges of managing so many different labels? Mm. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate to be very well assisted. So, creating a great team around me has been just the most important part. And again, I'm very fortunate that we have a very capable, talented team of people that make this happen. Um, what's something that you look for um, when selecting someone for your team? Like, what are some qualities or attributes? Hmm. Um, decisiveness is one. Um, somebody that is not afraid to learn a lot and learn on the spot. Um, creativity. Um, yeah, surprisingly, not too many attributes that you actually find on a necessarily on a on a college resume or resume period uh, but just a lot of you know things that you would need to discover after four or five days of you know being around that person so it's a very challenging aspect of hiring a team is that you usually don't get that luxury of having that much time so uh, my interview process is always a little long sometimes people can find it lingering but uh, it allows us to really make sure that we get along quite well and then can you talk a little bit about the purchase of Highland Estates? Mm, so we were fortunate enough to buy uh, Highland Estate in 2007. Um, beautiful property. Um, it was just uh, amazing to see those old vines that were planted in 1971. Um, and literally, not that it had been neglected, but it hadn't been given quite the TLC that it deserved. And so being able to apply ourselves to really make that beautiful property even greater has been just a really thrill and a really great journey. And then um, what made you want to buy the, not only buy the vineyard but then start a label um, in itself? Well you know having this vineyard that is 40 years old that had been so well commanded and acclaimed by so many wines uh, and just kind of feeling like it was a little bit of an orphan without a name or without a wine attached to it was a little disappointing. So that was the main reason for us to say, hey, Highland exists and here is the, the brand behind it. So uh, we had the good fortune also of having some very talented in-house creators that designed the label that is quite striking and quite noticeable. And so, um, you know, 
Actually, there was somebody graduated from Leadfield. <laughs> Um, and then West Mountain is one of your newest labels. What mm -hmm. was the impetus of starting that? So we've created so many different brands that are called value Pinot Noirs for other customers. You know, we were talking about our, our controlled brand a little bit earlier, uh, that we realized that we're very good at it. We know how to make some really great wines at this great price point. And it was time for us to have a brand that, you know, reflected a little bit all the activities that we have, but also that would be able to make a real impact in that price value category. Uh, so Robert and I went to Montreal actually and we were looking for an idea of a name and found that section of Montreal called Westmount, realizing that there was a lot of fur trading company that were related to Oregon uh, in that sector. And so it all started making sense and for us Westmount represents the journey west. It's going west to the mountain. Uh, it's also, uh, you know, a brand that is associated with the outside. It's, you know, for the mountaineers, it's for the hikers, it's for the bikers, it's, you know, anybody that enjoys kind of taking some time outside. And most of us in Oregon, I think, enjoy that. And that's why we're here. That's why we suffer through the winter to be able to enjoy those beautiful summer days. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's really a brand that, again, has a spirit around the Oregon um, wine country. And then what would you say is your winemaking philosophy? Oh, that's a tough one. I like to say that I'm very off-handed and so I don't like to be very um, active on, on the wine. I'd like to actually let the wine represent the place. And so being hands off as much as possible is probably my attribute and what I try to do the most. Mm -hmm. And then uh, um, how do you make a great wine regardless of the audience or the price? How do you make a great wine regardless of the audience of the price? Well, I don't think that, you know, a wine is necessarily quality is driven by the price, you know, so mm -hmm. I think you're putting two things there that may not um, equate. I mean, uh, there's plenty of expensive wines that are not great and vice versa. Uh, so, but if you're asking how do you make a, a great wine, period, I think that, um, again, every winemaker has his own philosophy and depending on the journey that he or she takes, um, you're more and less successful. Again, for me, identifying a site that I think is very unique and being able to express that site into a bottle of wine is the goal. Uh, so when I feel that I've consistently delivered that, when some of my customers and some of the people that try the wine can say, oh, this is a Domaine de Laurent, this is a Yamel Carlton, this is a Walt Kenzie soil, this is, this is consistent with what I know of the property and I recognize it, this is the best you know, accomplishment for me. Um, you mentioned this a little bit about um, selling the wine is difficult and a lot of people mm -hmm. we interview also talk about how that's sometimes the most difficult part of being in the industry. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about selling wine? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, when you look at wine sales, um, there is now roughly 600 labels in Oregon or 600 brands. So think about the fact that uh, most of us make at least four or five different wines under those brands. So here you are at 2,500, and then there is 5,000 plus in California, same numbers. And then we're not counting Italy, Spain, Portugal, France. Um, you can imagine how those numbers just multiply. So in the global American market, uh, we're competing against hundreds, thousands, uh, sometime, you know, hundreds of thousands of labels. Uh, so it's a very, very competitive market. You have to be there all the time. You have to be able to consistently tell your story and you have to be relevant. You have to be making sure that the sales force remembers your story. Um, so it's definitely a lot of work and um, some of us are better at it than others uh, because, you know, you, you can be a little bit more um, extravagant or not or, you know, tell your story in a way that people remember it better than others. So. Uh, but it's definitely, I, I haven't met a winemaker yet that is saying that selling wine is really easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what wine associations um, through the years have you, have you been a part of and what positions have you had in those? 
So I have been part of the Pinot Noir celebration and I've been twice the president. Uh, I've been with the Willamette Valley Wineries Association and I've been the president as well. Um, and now I'm the chair of the current uh, Willamette Valley uh, Barrel Auction uh, for this coming year, 2018. Um, yeah, that's about in the wine industry. That would be the only association that I've been associated with. Why, with all these other things that you're doing, why do you think it's important to be a part of these associations? Um, well, I think that you know everybody that is committed to this industry owes to the rest of the industry to participate in, in you know, the greater good and making sure that all those associations that were just you know embryonic at some point are are getting the right structure, the right growth, the, you know, the right spirit. Um, so, no, I think that anybody that is part of an industry in general wants to be, uh, you know, part of the growth that a region can, can encounter with that particular industry. And I think especially in Oregon, you have that spirit of conviviality, of sharing, uh, that is amazing, that doesn't exist as much everywhere else. Uh, so being part of that group is a, is a critical, critical aspect, I think, of everybody probably that you've interviewed. And then how has the Oregon wine industry changed since you first joined it? Oh, well, I think that, as I said, you know, when I was here in 1988, we, I believe, had about um, 70 to 80 wineries now we almost tenfold that so obviously it's grown considerably but most importantly we have made a name for ourselves there is no going back Oregon and the Willamette Valley in particular is one of the very best area in the world to grow Pinot Noir uh, that is a fact that is no longer being disputed by anybody and so that's a pretty pretty amazing accomplishment over the last you know, three decades. And then, um, what do you think about, uh, oh, yeah, you know, what do you think about outside influences like Jackson Family Wines or investors from France coming into Oregon? Well, I think it's, we have to be open-minded that they will uh, respect some of the, you know, conviviality that I talked about, the sharing and all that. And I think so far, uh, most of the uh, outside commitment that's come to Oregon has been very respectful of what's been done before and kind of following the same uh, same breed. So, uh, so far it's been pretty good and I, you know, anticipate it will continue. I mean, obviously we're getting at 30 years or 40 years, 50 years max of the Oregon wine industry's life. And so you will see some changes, obviously some generational changes are going to start happening. And uh, so we'll see some new faces and we just hope that we can, you know, keep the spirit of Oregon together. And so far, I don't see, again, any of those uh, coming from the outside and influencing the spirit in a negative way. And then what is in the future for your different businesses and labels? Oh, God. <laughs> Somebody else only knows. No, we, we're growing, so we keep on expanding. I mean, there's definitely a sector of the wine industry that likes what we call controlled brands. Essentially, we partner with somebody that knows how to sell wine well. Uh, you know, I was telling you that we enjoy and we know how to make wine, and that's an easier task than to sell it. So we like that partnership with somebody that knows how to sell wine, and we end up just making it, and that's something that is good. So it's growing very rapidly for us, and hopefully it will keep on growing. And then what do you think is in the future for the Oregon wine industry? Again, I think that one of the key elements of growth is going to be making sure that we target the whole segment of the population. At this point, we've been recognized as making some of the very best wine in the world. Um, even though it's a great price value when you compare with the rest of Burgundy, for example, it's still an expensive proposition. A 50 to $60 dollar bottle of wine is not something that everybody can enjoy on a more regular basis. And so I think the challenge for Oregon is definitely to uh, continue making the very best wine, continue discovering some beautiful areas. I think the 
the sky's the limit. There's still a lot of land to be discovered that can make amazing wines. Uh, but at the same time, having that important statement of saying that we can make a quality wine that uh, a broader segment of the population can really enjoy. I think that's a good challenge for us to have. And then um, you're talking about how there's about like 600 brands here in Oregon. Do mm -hmm. you think that's going to continue to grow? Do you think we've hit our max on brands or do you think it's going to shrink? You know, I think that at this point the market continues to have great interest for Oregon. Uh, so I don't see this going backwards. And then um, what advice do you have for someone that is looking to join the Oregon wine industry now? Well, I just it depends on how you're looking at joining the industry. You know, if you've uh, gone to UC Davis and you want to be a winemaker, great, fantastic. You know, we'll offer you some internship and we'll make sure that you get the, the very best advice. Um, the I think if you are thinking about people getting into the wine industry just, uh, you know, as a hobby, you know, buying a vineyard, investing, creating a house and thinking that all your grapes are always going to be the most beautiful and you'll find somebody to buy them, then I would caution you to be a little bit more realistic. Um, so there is definitely a lot of growth potentially in the wine industry. Um, certainly for young professionals that are you know, college educated, there will be great opportunities in our industry at every sector from accounting to marketing to production. Um, I think all those segments are, are really poised to grow pretty dramatically. And so that's all the questions we have for you. Do you See, have anything that else that easy. you want to say? I think that was good. Okay, awesome. You covered a lot of grounds. Yeah. Well, thank you. Cool.